On much of the continent of Africa, the cowtail switch is a symbol of authority. It's usually carried by the king, the chief, whoever's in charge. And it's also often carried by the griot. The griot is the official storyteller of the oral historian. I'd like to tell you the story of the cowtail switch. Once a long, long, long time ago, Dr. Tamara Butler, the Executive Director for the Avery Research Center of African American History and Culture. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual Black History Month program. What we want you to understand is that Black History is 365 days of the year. And this month, February, is just our anniversary, an opportunity to highlight all of the important people, the culture, the art that we have here in the Low Country. Because we know that without it, people will continue to go on in the world without an understanding of who they are. So we hope that you will enjoy our program, that you will stay tuned, and that post-COVID, you'll be able to come and join us here at the center. Avery was established as a school for African Americans in 1865 in the city of Charleston. It was a very unique school for the time period in that uh, it was a private school. It was funded by the American Missionary Association and Avery also had a teaching component so that graduates could then go on and receive a teacher certificate. And they were able to use that to teach in black schools throughout Charleston County. At the time, they were banned from teaching within the city limits. However, over time, they advocated on their own behalf in order to achieve the right to teach within the city limits. So in 1916, Avery became uh, fully staffed by African-American teachers and faculty. So in addition to being a place where opportunity was created for African-Americans, Avery was also a very nurturing and progressive space for Black Charleston. Uh, Avery was home to the first NAACP chapter here in Charleston, founded largely by Avery graduates, and they invited W.E.B. Du Bois to the campus to speak to the student body as well as to organize. One of their most successful campaigns was the Black Teacher Campaign in 1916. Um, and over time, Avery graduates continued to be active in advocating on behalf of rights for, of African Americans in Charleston. Um, when it comes to civil rights, the Black uh, hospital worker strike, and, and many other movements. So the Avery ended up closing its doors in 1954 as a school, and the building really uh, was in disrepair at the time, and the city was actually looking at selling the property to developers uh, who were interested in converting the property into condominiums. So Avery graduates actually got together to save the building and they created the Avery Institute for Afro-American History and Culture in the late 70s and negotiations began with the College of Charleston, which is just a few blocks away. And in 1985, the Avery Research Center for African-American History and Culture was opened and it continues to create opportunities for African-Americans today through its museum, its archive, its art gallery, as well as its public programming and outreach.
the inside of me May you delight In the inside In the inside of me Come feel my life From the inside From the inside So this is the Gullah Geechee exhibit. Uh, this is my favorite exhibit because I have a personal connection to it. The photos that you see here on the wall are from Johns Island and James Island. The photos taken on Johns Island uh, were taken in the 1960s and the photos taken on James Island were taken in 2019. The photos taken in James Island were actually on Solid Gree Road, uh, you know, known as Solid Gree to the local community. And I have a special connection here because this is where my family is from. They've been there for generations. They got there uh, because my fourth great grandfather, Harrison Wilder, he was enslaved in Sumter, South Carolina. He fought in the Civil War as a United States Colored Troop in the 104th Regiment out of Beaufort um, under Mar uh, Major Martin Delaney. And once he fought in the Civil War and once he obtained his freedom and the freedom of others, he decided to go to Solid Gree Island, purchase land on Solid Gree Island, um, and that land that he purchased is the land that my family is still living on today. So this photo is of my uncle Ernest, Ernest Parks. He's a direct descendant of, of Harrison Wilder, as I mentioned before. Um, he's a really important, integral part of the Solid Greek community because he was one of the pioneers in uh, restoring the Seashore Farmers Lodge. And the Seashore Farmers Lodge was essentially, it was a mutual aid cooperative, and during the the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th century, uh, mutual aid cooperatives and lodges and fraternal societies and secret societies, uh, they were all very popular amongst black communities because it was very dangerous to organize um, for labor rights, for racial rights, for political rights, um, etc. So they had to do this in secrecy and they had to do this, you know, in a very organized manner. The lodge served as a educational facility, so it was a school, it was a church, it was a funeral home, it was a recreational center. They even had a drive-through movie where they were projected on the lodge. Um, so it was everything. It was a center of communal life on Solid Gree until uh, Mosquito Beach, the rise of Mosquito Beach in about the 1950s. Um, then Mosquito Beach kind of became the, the center of social and, and cultural activity but it all started with the lodge. And we have foodways that are popular. You know, when people think about soul food, they're usually talking about Gullah Geechee food and foodways. Um, even beyond soul food, um, the seafood, the crab boils, the blue crabs, the oysters, the clams, um, the, the red rice, which is another example of the continuity. Hey everybody, I'm Amethyst Ganaway. I am a chef and food writer from North Charleston, South Carolina. Today we're going to be talking about our connection to rice, um, red rice. Of course, we're going to be doing a very, very simple, basic, easy recipe that you can build off of and just talking about the culture, um, how important it is to Gullah Geechee culture, to low country culture, to Black American culture, to the diaspora. 
Um, and hopefully we will learn a lot of things along the way. So, so I always like to start mine off on um, the stove and then I like to finish it off in the oven. So what I have is some already kind of diced up bacon. I'm gonna throw that in and I'm gonna start letting that cook down. So you wanna render off as much of the fat as you possibly can. Get this bacon nice and crispy, take the bacon out, keep the fat in. So in here, I just have my um, my bacon rendering down, getting cooked. I want this to get crispy, and I want a lot of that um, excess fat in there to cook down as well. Okay, so my um, tomato paste is darker in color. My onions and peppers and celery is nice and they're nice and soft. So what I'm going to do now is add my washed rice. Washing rice to me is, like I, I think I said before, it's like a really intimate um, spiritual experience. Because, you know, I do it the same way every single time, you know. Um, and I was taught that way by my family who we'll stopped by their older family um how, how to properly wash and cook rice and you know why it's important to do it that way um and again you know it's so surprising now that i work in food as a living and you realize so many people don't know how to wash rice or don't know why they have to wash rice um and and granted not every um not every dish that uses rice requires it to be washed but you know for me when you're making these kind of one pot rice dishes it, it does make a difference in um you know what how it ends up coming up so i got my eye back up i'm also going to add in i just have some petite diced um tomatoes in their liquid so i'm going to add all that in there's about one can some people prefer to use tomato sauce, like I said, um, fresh tomatoes. Obviously, we're going to be used before we would use um, canned tomatoes. But I kind of like the the texture that come that it comes with um, when I use the petite dice. Sometimes, most of the time, I will use tomato paste. But I'm also now going to get some. Go ahead and add my salt and pepper and seasonings and just kind of going off feel so the low country is directly correlated directly related to the rice growing regions of West Africa, um, especially when it comes to Gullah Geechee people and people that are particularly from other Creole areas like Louisiana, the deltas, um, places where rice could grow in climates that are very similar to those in West Africa. Um, we all share a really, really, really rich history that is really closely connected with one, of an with one another, specifically for the fact that you know, our ancestors were brought here because of their ability to grow rice. All right, so usually most people, or a lot of people like to um, just finish it off in a pot. I like to finish mine off in the oven. Like I said, they get that kind of, um, I like a much more dry consistency from um, my red rice personally. So I like to put mine in a bacon dish and then I will cover this with foil and stick it in my oven to cook. Make sure you get all the liquid in there because your rice needs that to essentially get nice and soft up and cook in it. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to 
put a lid on this just because I have one for the sake of it. And that'll actually help the rice get nice and nice and steam. So I'm going to oven. So take the lid off, fluffing it with a fork. Never want to stir. There you go. Easy red rice. That's simple. You know, to this day, we don't see the level of black farmers or, or whatever that should be or could be growing rice. Um, and in a way, you know, we have this really intimate, close, sacred, almost religious um, connection to it. And it's really important for us to kind of just remember that. So, you know, we're known for eating so much rice in a little country, but so many people don't really understand why or where that came from. Greetings, peace to all. My name is Chef Weeby. I am the co-founder of Arts and Remedies Wellness, which is located here in the beautiful low country of Charleston, South Carolina. I am a holistic plant-based chef. I am a food justice activist and I am a farm farmer. I help people use plant-based foods and remedies to help heal themselves. When the late Dr. Adeo Funian and I created Arts and Remedy Wellness, we wanted to create a space where all people, young and old, can learn how to eat healthy and make healthier food choices, use plant-based food and herbal medicines, and become self-sufficient and connect back to the land through growing food. This Black History Month and all year round, I encourage you to honor your ancestors and connect back to the land by growing your own food. And one easy way to grow your own food is by sprouting. Sprouting is a system and a practice where you can sprout and germinate seeds, grains, beans, and legumes. Sprouting is a super easy way to grow your own food cheaply. It's very healthy and it's super fun to do. So today we are going to learn how to sprout mung beans. Mung beans are legumes that are super, super healthy. They have a lot of fiber, they have a lot of protein, vitamin A, vitamin B, and vitamin C. So to get started, you'll take your mung bean, they're tiny little green beans, and you're going to soak them for six to eight hours in water. You can use any container, and you let them sit and soak. You're gonna drain off these beans the next day and you're gonna put them in a container. It can be a plastic container or a glass container. And for the next two days, you're gonna rinse and dry your mung beans. Within two days, your mung beans will start sprouting and then within seven days, they grow into shoots. So again, this is an easy way to connect back to Mother Earth, connect and honor our ancestors, and learn how to help yourselves and your community and family by eating healthy, by growing your own food. Happy sprouting, stay healthy. Until the next time, peace. We the Geechee Experience. Geechee Experience, way out ya. Way out ya, hitting y'all with that word video. So the first word is raw. Raw. Let a boy know what raw mean though. So raw, that basically just mean, you know, when, something, some, when somebody is good or something good. Like, you know, let's say your homeboy, he good at basketball. You'll probably hear somebody down here say, hey, that boy raw. Hey. Get out. So raw basically means to be good in something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So the next word is storian. Storian. Hey, what storian mean? So right? storian just basically mean lies. You know, you hear somebody down here. Say, Stop storian. Right. Hey, you storian on my name? I ain't see that. Come Bruh, on. I just went to outer space last week. Boy, stop storian. No, you lying. So that's almost like a nicer yeah. way to say lying without saying lying. Right. Because you know, back in the day, if you say lying, it don't sound good. No. Right. And like sometimes you get your behind cut. You know, if you say lie, you gotta say story. Flashbacks.
Sorry. <laughs> Next word is run out. Run out. Hey, I be telling my little turn is almost every day because they always be running out. And running out is basically me, like misbehavior. You know, they doing something they know they ain't got no business doing. Like, hey man, why are you running out? Why is you climbing on top of that tree? Like sometimes cat might be, in, it might even be in a club and be like, hey, you can buy me a drink. Guy might be like, boy, you run out of it. Okay, but I must be here if y'all chat. But I know some of the ladies do buy fellas, but I'm tripping. But I just trying to give a basic example of running out. Boy, you're running out, you know? Okay. Next word is old lady. Well, look at the old lady is pretty much, it can be your mama, it can be your girlfriend, you know? Um, but your old lady is pretty much a woman that you care deeply about, mm -hmm. you know? So that's your old lady right there. If you care deeply about her. That's your mama. You care deeply about her. That's your old lady. Your girl, your wife, anybody that you really care deeply about, that's your old lady. Hey, your old lady say you can come out tonight? The next one is dumb and out. Dumb now pretty much can mean like acting out, showing off. Amped up. Yeah, a lot of me. Amped up. Yeah, dumb and out can be a lot of things. So somebody say, boy, you dumb and out. I'm about to dumb out on you. Dumb and out on you might mean like you probably gonna get into a fight real soon. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just be cautious and be aware of the way dumb and out is being used. So if you find yourself in a situation where somebody's about to dumb out on you, you need to be careful. <laughs> You calm down. Right. Or if somebody say you dumbing out, you might want to check your behavior because you acting a little amped up. So dumbing out might mean something positive or something negative. You just gotta listen for them context clues. Listen for the context clues. Next word we got is ski. Like y'all had to do this for the old school now. Y'all know I 31 years old out here. So ski, man, we used to that's that's a way to grab attention. Young women do not like that. Ski ye, hey ski ye. But we do it. And some girls turn around for it, some girls don't. It's just to grab attention. I might even do the little homeboy. Hey, yo, ski, yay! Hey. You might not turn around. But everything, game. What the next? Oh, is this the it? I know it is. The next one we got is? Sausage. So my little sis said, like how we say it when we call a switch, but we say sausages. I had realized that Bahamas say it, you know, they say sarches, just like we see sarches. Look here, yeah, I know when y'all get home, y'all talking about mama, I can get that Roger West sarches. No, you just eat. <laughs> we appreciate your boy checking us out, man. Hey, subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook and YouTube and, and Instagram. And the Twitter. And the Twitty. Show us some love, y'all boy. Show the love all of us, man. We'll see y'all boy in the next video, man. Hey, we out child, Geechee experience. Hello, my name is Dr. Sean Mitchell. To my right, I have my brother Julian Mitchell. To my left, I have my brother Trevor Mitchell. Uh, we are three of the six founders of Sweetgrass Clothing Company. Um, Sweetgrass Clothing Company is a clothing brand, a streetwear brand founded in Charleston, South Carolina around the year of 2018. Um, our main symbolism for Sweetgrass Clothing Company is the Palmetto Rose. Uh, the Palmetto Rose historically is a symbol of the Gullah Geechee heritage. It's made from a palm leaf that is taken from the palm trees that are found in South Carolina, which is the Palmetto State. The palm leaf is fashioned into a rose and is primarily made by hand. Um, the history of this uh, sweetgrass rose is during the Civil War, um, when the men went to fight, they went and fought on both sides. The women would fashion this rose from the palm leaf and put it on the lapels of the men who went and fought in these wars. Um, this symbol meant that the person who was fighting was loved and protected by someone outside of this war zone. So it started to become a symbol of love. It started to become a symbol of that someone out there um, was thinking about you at all times. We felt that in the current social climate, that is what a lot of our people in the Gullah Geechee culture are missing. We curated our entire first collection around the symbol of the blood moon. So if you see the colorways that we selected in our garments, our hoodies, our crew necks, our polos and t-shirts are our only colors found in the blood moon and nothing else. This is why we don't have a whole lot of different color selections when it comes to our collections. Our, all of our collections have a deeper meaning to the Gullah Geechee people. And we like to keep that in everything, the colorway, the symbolism, and everything. So 
with the Blood Moon collection, we had uh, the dark red, which is found in the Blood Moon, the grayish uh, hues that are found in the Blood Moon, and then you had the black. Um, there's also uh, a white tint that's in there. Um, so all of the items you can see in our collection have the dark red, the gray, the black, and the white. And that is all to symbolize the blood moon and the redemption of the Gullah Geechee culture. This is important because we believe that uh, it is an honor to be a part of the Gullah Geechee Nation. We take a lot of pride in who we are and where we come from. Um, our mother was a historian, or is a historian, and she taught us a lot about ourselves. And in teaching us about ourselves, um, we picked up a lot of lessons that we have decided to, uh, we didn't think that it weren't, they were embraced enough. So we decided to embrace them ourselves. We weren't, we're not looking for someone external to our community to embrace our community or recognize our community. We recognize our community ourselves. So this is why the Sweetgrass Clothing Company is very important because if you go downtown, you'll see the women making the sweetgrass baskets and you'll see the young uh, kids, the artisans, making sweetgrass roses to sell. But in one aspect, we own that part of the production, but we don't own the commercialization of that production. And that's what Sweetgrass Clothing Company is. It's taking that same idea of those women on the side of the roads and, those, and their grandkids and those artisans creating downtown Charleston and we're putting it on ourselves so that we can wear it at all times. If you come to Charleston, you'll see this in about eight out of 10 cars on the dashboards. Um, so we decided to put it on everyone's chest to let everybody know that if you're wearing this symbol, you're loved and protected by somebody. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. If you got on the symbol of the Sweetgrass Clothing Company, it means that you are loved and protected and you are family. I'd like to tell you the story of the cowtail switch. Once a long, long, long time ago, 
in a very small village in West Africa, there lived a family. Now the family was made up of the king, his wife, whom he loved very much, and she loved him just as much. And they had five grown-up, very special sons. Now these sons were special, first of all, because they were very obedient young men. They were also very industrious, very hard-working young men. But they were truly special because they knew a kind of magic that the old people call the juju magic. And that simply means that they had certain powers. They could do things that people like you and I can't do. Well, now, in addition to those five grown-up sons, the king and his wife were expecting a baby. And they were very happy and very excited about this baby that was coming. One day, the king decided to go for a walk, just to look over his territory. Now, he walked for a long, long time and a great, great distance. And unfortunately, he didn't return to the village. Well, everybody wondered what happened to him. But after a while, they all went on with their lives without him. Now, time passed, more time passed, and still more time passed. And eventually, that baby was born. Like most babies, it grew, it developed, learned how to crawl, learned how to walk, and then it learned how to talk. Now, that baby's first words were not simple words like mama or baba or dada. That baby's first words were, where is my father? Well, after the baby asked that question, the older brothers decided to go and look for their father. And they headed off in the direction in which the father had gone. And they walked for a long time and a great, great distance. Eventually, they found their father. At least they found what was left of him. You see, unfortunately, he'd been attacked by some wild animals. All that was left of him were his bones. And those bones were scattered all over the side of the road in no particular order. And they knew the bones belonged to their father because his beautiful cow tail switch was lying nearby. Well, you remember I said those brothers knew a certain kind of magic, the juju magic? They decided to use that juju magic to help their father. The first son stood over the bones and said, I will put father's bones back together. And he said some magic words, and the bones started moving all by themselves. And they didn't stop moving until they were back in perfect order. The father was a perfect skeleton again. The second son said, I will cover those bones with flesh. And he said some magic words, and just like that, the flesh covered the father's bones. The third son said, I will cover those, that flesh with skin to protect it, and I will give father back his hair, his teeth, and all of his organs so his body will work again. And that was done. And then the fourth son said, I will give father his blood. And he said some magic words, and the blood just started flowing through his father's veins. And then finally the fifth son came forward and said, I will give father the breath of life. And he knelt next to his father's body. He placed his mouth to his father's mouth, and he started blowing air into his father's body. And before you know it, the father started breathing on his own again. He was alive. He opened his eyes and he looked about him. He saw his sons and he was so happy to see them. He hugged them and they hugged him right back. And after their reunion, they all went back to the village again. Well, now, needless to say, when they got back to the village, the people were overjoyed to see their king alive and well again. And they decided to have a great big celebration. And they invited all the people from the neighboring villages to come and join them in their celebration. And on that day, they came and they wore their beautiful ceremonial clothes. And the drummers were drumming with perfect rhythm. The dancers were dancing to the beats of the talking drums. And of course, the cooking pots were just bubbling over with good food to eat. Well, now that celebration lasted well into the next day. And finally, when it was over and all the people had gone back to their neighboring villages, the father called his sons to his side. And he sat them down and he said, my sons, I am so proud of you. I am so pleased with you. 
that you were able to come and find me and put my body back together and bring me back to life and get me back to our village. And to show you just how pleased I am with you, I want to give my beautiful, very special cow tail switch to the one son who is most responsible for bringing this about. Well, now, all the sons wanted the cow tail switch. And each one thought that he deserved it because of his contribution. The first son stood up and said, well, father, give it to me. After all, I'm the one who got everything started. I put your bones back together. That's most important. The second son just as quickly got up and said, but father, where would you be just a bunch of bones on the roadside had I not covered those bones with flesh? That's more important. Give me the cow tail switch. The third son said, but father, would you be satisfied being just bones and flesh? It was I who gave you your skin to protect that flesh. I gave you back your hair and your teeth and all of your organs so your body would work again. Surely you know that's more important than just bones and flesh. The fourth son said, Father, it was I who gave you your blood. And surely you know you cannot live without blood. I deserve the cow tail switch. And finally, the fifth son said, Father, all of these things that my brothers did for you are very important. But had it not been for me giving you the breath of life, why, you'd still be lying there dead on the roadside. I deserve the cow tail switch. Give it to me. Well, at that point, the brothers started arguing among themselves. And the father, very quickly tired of hearing the arguing, and he stood up and he put his hand up like this, and they knew that meant for them to be quiet, and they were instantly quiet. Of course, remember, they were very obedient young men. Well, the father began speaking. He said, my sons, all of you, all of you played an important part in getting me back to the village. But there's one among you who played the most important part of all. And that one and that one only will get my cow tail switch. With that, the father picked up his cow tail switch and he walked over to where all of his sons were seated and he placed the cow tail switch, that beautiful special cow tail switch, in the arms of the baby. For you see, it was the baby whose question, where is my father, prompted the older brothers to go and look for their father. And that baby got to keep the cowtail switch for the rest of his life. And that story, like so many of our African folk tales, has a moral, a lesson that we learn as a result of hearing it. And the moral of that story is simply this, that a man, woman, or child is not really dead until he or she is forgotten by the loved ones. From the Ashante people, in Ghana, in West Africa, the cow tail switch.